Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone again. Hello. Hello. Oh, so noisy. I know. What can you do? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I've always appreciated the, uh, the old school tapping on a glass manoeuvre. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome today to the Australian Institute of Energy Perth WA election energy event, a debate between three worthy comrades who are going to battle it out in front of us. Uh, my name is Genevieve Simpson. I'm chair of the Perth branch of the Australian Institute of Energy. Uh, I would, of course, like to acknowledge our esteemed guests today, the uh, Honourable Bill Johnston, uh, the Honourable Tim Clifford, and Dr David Honey, uh, who is, of course, the man of the hour. I think we can all probably agree, being energy nerds, up until about a week ago, this was going to be a really pleasant event. It was going to be pleasant. You know, we were going to have a nice time. Uh, and then uh, Dr David Honey turned things on their head a little bit. And uh, we now have quite the event to look forward to today. I think we all think that, uh, boy, I hope that you guys can live up to the challenge because we're expecting a lot. This is a, more than people have talked about energy in WA for a very long time. Um, so we will, of course, be able to go to our, our guest speakers very shortly. Um, and we're very pleased to be able to have Dan Mercer from the ABC as our moderator today. Um, but before going to that and having our lunch, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Um, we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and many of you might not know, but I'm, I'm a geographer by trade. Um, and I'm surprised that there aren't more geographers in energy because energy is intrinsically geographical. Um, we talk about fields and we talk about farms and we talk about lines and we talk about sites. Uh, but all of those have to exist in a geographical context. Um, and today I want to acknowledge that the energy policies that we speak about won't just exist for the Noongar people. Uh, and today I want to pay our respects also to the people um, of the other Noongar nation, uh, another Indigenous nations, the Yamaji people, the Wangathar people, the Nanyajara lands people and the people of the Kimberley country. Uh, a couple of uh, COVID requirements, of course. Um, we do have the uh, always necessary hand sanitizer at the back of the room. Um, hopefully you've all signed in using your Safe WA app or have provided your name on a piece of paper, if not. Um, we do have, if there is an emergency, the fire exits behind you, the three doors which you just came through. Um, please be very gentle with each other if there is an emergency. You know, we can maintain a lower level of energy in vacating. Um, but hopefully uh, we won't have to worry about that today. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into the event structure today. It's a proper debate. So each of our speakers will have seven minutes to get an introduction. Um, they will have a timekeeper, and then Dan will also has the permission to interject, tell them when enough is enough. Uh, and then after that, they will get three minutes to provide a rebuttal to what the previous speakers have said. Um, and then after that, we'll be opening it up to the floor for questions and answers. So please start putting on your thinking caps now um, and thinking about what questions you could ask. Um, we'll be back in about 15 minutes to start the debate, uh, and in the meantime, I hope you all enjoy your lunch. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm around, um, but otherwise, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, everyone is enjoying their lunch. Uh, it's my pleasure now to speak more loudly until people stop talking. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure now to um, introduce Dan Mercer. Dan has more than 12 years experience in journalism, formerly working as a senior reporter for the West Australian newspaper and now for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Primarily covering politics and business with a particular focus on the energy industry, which is why, of course, he's here today. Uh, Daniel Mercer is currently the rural reporter with ABC Great Southern and we are lucky to have him here 
visiting us from Albany just for today's event. Uh, so please welcome Dan, our moderator for today's presentation, and I will also ask the politicians to join us up on the stage. Good afternoon, and thanks, Genevieve, for the introduction. Um, so, look, uh, I am still reporting on energy, I might just clarify, <laughs> albeit in a peripheral way. Uh, but certainly it's an area I've reported on for a long time, and it's not because anyone was telling me I had to, it's because I frankly enjoyed it. Uh, at the outset, I'd actually just like to give a special thanks to David Honey and the Liberal Party for <laughs> spicing it up today. Um, <laughs> I was actually among those who thought this could be uh, bordering on a, a slightly dull kind of affair without that sort of excitement, but I, I'm really glad you did. So, look, although I've been reporting on energy for a long time, uh, I haven't ever moderated a debate uh, on anything, let alone politics and energy, so please bear with me as I try to keep the honourable MPs <coughs> on the straight and narrow. Um, Firstly, an introduction of today's speakers. On the lectern to my left is Bill Johnston, the Minister for Energy. He was first elected to Parliament in 2008, representing the seat of Cannington, and before that was a former State Secretary of the WA Labor Party. And uh, prior to that, uh, a long-time official of the SDA, is that right, Bill? Um, since being elected, he's held a variety of shadow and ministerial positions, including industrial relations and mines and petroleum, though I do suspect that energy is his favourite child. Um, as an aside, Bill's also fluent in Bahasa, Indonesia. On the second lectern will be David Honey, the member for Cottesloe and the shadow minister for energy, renewables and hydrogen, as well as water, industrial development and lands. David was elected to Parliament in the runoff created by Colin Burnett's retirement in 2018. And before this, he held a variety of senior positions at aluminium giant Alcoa, including global residue manager for the company's refining operations. He originally comes from a farm at Cranbrook in the Great Southern and has a background in science, particularly chemistry, in which he holds a PhD. And speaking of the Great Southern, it's where our third speaker on the far left to me hails from as well, that's Tim Clifford, who's the Greens MLC for the East Metropolitan Region, who grew up in Albany. He was elected to Parliament in 2017 and holds the portfolios of climate change, energy and science for the Greens, uh, among quite a few others, I might add. In a past life, Tim was a judicial support officer and studied politics, international relations and journalism at university. And in his high school leaving book, he also wrote that his nickname was Doz, and Dozer, uh, and his ambition was listed as taking over the world and dunking on Conan. So uh, <laughs> I'll have to get you to elaborate on that later. Yeah. Um, just to quick, quickly recap the rules, each speaker will be given seven minutes to lay out their case. At the end of all that, they'll be given three minutes for rebuttal or to raise questions of the other speakers. There's a timing system in place. So the speakers will need to be cogent and concise and we'll be keeping them to it. Once that's finished, we'll throw it open to questions from the floor. Now let's get started. Minister, would you like to go? Thanks, Dan. Look, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional lands of the Noongar people and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues, uh, Dr David Honey and the Honourable Tim Clifford. I want to, as well, acknowledge the AIE National President Katie McKenzie and the AIE WA Chair Dr Genevieve Simpson. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. There's no question that there's a transition in the energy sector going on at the moment and WA Labor is ready for that. We're responding to that transition. Since we came to office, we've closed two coal plants, we've seen a 134% increase in rooftop uh, PV, we've seen a 111% increase in wind and we've seen a 1600% increase in large scale uh, PV. That's an extra 1,439 megawatts of capacity for renewables in the southwest interconnected system for an additional 124% of capacity. But there's more to be done and that work needs to be done through careful planning. And that's what we did with the Energy Transformation Strategy. 
who brought together the best energy minds in Western Australia to help develop a plan. And I want to thank Steve Edwell for his hard work in bringing that transformation task force together. Just let people re remind people that that uh, task force had 140 formal meetings with energy participant, market participants, as well as hundreds of informal sessions. And the energy transformation plan is the result. Just to remind you, that's the DER roadmap, that's the whole system plan, and that's the 700 pages of new market rules that you have all contributed to, to make Western Australia's energy system work with a higher renewable energy future. We know that's not the end, and we know that batteries are going to play a large part in the future of our energy transformation. So we have a future battery industry strategy that's not only about the deployments of batteries, but it's also about creating an industry, a manufacturing industry here in Western Australia there's already 15,000 people working in the battery industry. We know hydrogen is a major part of the future. So we have a renewable hydrogen strategy that my friend, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, is responsible for that's already been rolled out uh, across Western Australia and includes the world's first uh, at Denham where the State Government of Western Australia is investing in the world's first grid-connected hydrogen project uh, to, in a remote community to see whether we can do 100% uh, hydrocarbons off. We have the state electrical vehicle strategy for Western Australia because we know electric vehicles are coming. In fact, uh, you know, we've talked to the, electric, the car companies and they tell us that there won't be electric, uh, is ICE engines made in the future, they will all be electric cars. So the challenge isn't to work out who's going to buy them, it's about how do you make sure the, the infrastructure is in place to deal with them. And of course, we need to deal with climate change. And last year, we released the Western Australian Climate Policy, a plan to position Western Australia for a prosperous and resilient, resilient low carbon future. We know there's always more to be done, but we've got the plans in place, and we know those plans are working. And we're not finished with the transformation of energy in Western Australia. But I was quite horrified to see the Liberal Party's announcement last week. This is too risky. It's not a realistic plan for this state's energy. And it reflects Mr Kirkup's inexperience. It's simply not possible for two members of parliament and a staffer to write a genuine uh, plan for the future of energy in Western Australia. It's too risky. I invite everybody to have a look at their table and see the costings that I've uh, prepared. I'm not saying they're fully developed costings. What they are is a reasonable assumption about the costs involved in that project. And I invite Dr Honey to set out what, the, what he says are the costs. If he does not accept my costings, what cost does he attach to that, uh, to that uh, reckless uh, uh, policy that shows the inexperience that, uh, that's risking Western Australia? Recently, Mr Kirkup said that it's, these big projects are in the DNA of the Liberal Party. Well, this project reminds me of King Street. Announced before election to get a headline, disappear into the sand after, afterwards. I know what's in the Liberal Party's DNA, and it's privatisation. That's the one thing that we know that they can be counted on. And Western Australians can't risk the Liberal Party's privatisation agenda. Mark McGowan has kept Western Australia safe and strong. He's earned the respect of the community. With COVID and economic headwinds that we all know still batter, batter this state, we need Mark McGowan to provide the stable leadership <coughs> to keep Western Australia strong. Thank you all very much. Uh, David, would you please go? I will. Uh, look, well, thank you very much. And uh, I also want to uh, recognise the Minister, the Honourable Bill Johnson and the Honourable uh, Tim Clifford and uh, Genevieve and the AIE uh, for having me here today. Look, um, we've, we've got a very lot of slides, but I'm only going to go through them in a very superficial way um, just to cover the headlines on them. And if we can just go through quickly for the first slide. You all know that... You know, there, uh, 
apparently not going through. Western Australia is the epicentre for renewable energy in, in probably the world. Western Australia has half of Australia's wind energy generation capacity. Um, if we move to the uh, next slide, um, Western Australia has more than a third of Australia's solar energy generation capacity. We are utterly unique, and the Midwest, I might say, in relation to wind is especially unique, as we know from the wind generation capacity that is already there. The other thing that's fundamentally changed, and I've had lots and lots of discussions with lots of people, many people have no understanding, and I'm sure this educated room does, but in the general community, the massive transition in cost for renewable energy. Uh, wind energy has reduced in cost, the levelised cost of wind energy is reduced by 71% in the last 10 years. Solar energy levelised cost is reduced by 90% in the last 10 years. For both of those, the levelised cost of energy for both of those is just on five cents Australian. That's a massive uh, transition in the cost structure for it. Look, we're about a smarter, cleaner energy future for this state of Western Australia, and we think the government has to show leadership uh, in that process. We believe that Western Australia, and this is the government, should ta be targeting zero net emissions by 2030, and that's two decades earlier than Labor. We believe we'll achieve this by investing three billion, or at least the private sector investing $3 billion in 1,500 megawatts of renewable energy uh, in the Midwest. <coughs> We believe that the government uh, coal-fired owned power stations should be shut down. And can I say, they're shutting themselves down because they're not baseload, they're swing and they're up and down like a yo-yo. And I know I ran boilers in my previous life. It destroys the boilers in those facilities and their costs are enormous. Um, to enable the uh, connection to the grid, we need to complete phase two of the Midwest uh, uh, transmission project, and that is in store a 500 uh, million 330 kV transmission line from Three Springs. We also understand that this is not trivial. We know it's not simple. We know that it isn't a matter of snapping your fingers and saying that you're going to do it. You have to have stability in the network, and part of providing stability in the network is a 500 megawatt mega battery. Uh, to give that, uh, give that stability. Uh, we believe uh, that we need uh, the largest clean energy network in the country and we believe that people should be able to drive across the state using electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. Uh, we believe in a zero emission public transport system by 2030. Now we understand that there are contracts and obviously we don't cancel contracts, you sensibly transition contracts, but all our new contracts for the buses, uh, that are in our public transport system should be transferred over to hydrogen and uh, renewable energy. Um, as I've said, we believe in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the zero emissions by 2030. Now, we also believe uh, that, in fact, we have the opportunity. There's a golden opportunity now to transition our state into the largest green manufacturer in the world. We have a unique opportunity. Nowhere in the world will be able to produce hydrogen as cheaply as Western Australia. Uh, we will have, because of our combination of both wind and solar, that means we have the basis for transitioning our, our new manufacturing uh, sector into green hydrogen. Um, and uh, government has to facilitate that, but there are plenty of investment, um, are plenty of partners keen to invest in that. Um, we believe that there's a massive opportunity in the state, and certainly the major energy companies in Western Australia, so Woodside, Chevron and the others, believe that there is a massive opportunity to transition from gas to blue hydrogen to green hydrogen. And we believe that this project will facilitate that. And can I say importantly, with the shutdown of the BP uh, refinery at Kwinana, um, we believe that that uh, is going to uh, give us energy security in the state of Western Australia. We think that we can have massive diversification uh, in green steel, green hydrogen uh, and, and uh, associated manufacturing. The Minister's already talked about lithium. There's been some good work done and the State Government have done some good work and I acknowledge that. Um, and we want, to, we want to continue that and to progress it. Um, we know that natural gas is the natural transition to a clean energy future and we believe there is a massive opportunity for the gas producers in Western Australia to do that, in particular transitioning to blue hydrogen, recognising that natural gas replacing coal is going to reduce carbon emissions by 30% by itself. We, uh, um, and that will feed into it, we know that research and development is critically important. We know that if you transition from coal, you need a plan for collie, and that's why we've announced a $100 million uh, 
uh, fund to invest in transition of work uh, in Collie. We know that you can't do all of this um, without proper support. Uh, we've announced $100 million for an industry attraction fund to bring, bring new industries to Western Australia. $100 million for the International Market Diversification Fund. $50 million for the Critical Strategic Manufacturing uh, Fund. And importantly, $50 million for an overarching government agency in state development that will manage this process. We know it's not simple. We know it needs uh, coordination. We also believe in a smarter, cleaner transport future, which is why we've announced uh, our policies in relation to uh, the electric network uh, and the hydrogen network in the state. We believe you should be able to go from Perth uh, to Caratha and Port Hedland uh, using hydrogen in large scale vehicles. Um, we have uh, developed a detailed roadmap for that, so the de devoting $2 million to the future transport roadmap, $10 million to the future office uh, of uh, transport, of alternative transport. Look, we're, we provided choice in gas when we were in government. Uh, we made sure that households in Perth could have access to cheaper gas, and we believe that households in Perth should have access to cheaper electricity, and that's why we've also announced that we will have contestable electricity uh, in Western Australia, in the government agencies. Importantly, the bottom line there is, there is a no asset sale guarantee. We've wit written to the agencies and we've written to the unions involved. It is an ironclad guarantee that we will not privatise any of the existing government energy agencies. Thanks, David. I'll get you to leave it there if I can, please. Tim, it's uh, your turn. Thank you, uh, Daniel. And uh, I'd just like to thank the Australian Institute of Energy for um, putting this event on today and to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues, uh, the uh, Dr David Honey and the Honourable Bill Johnson. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. As many people in this room would be aware, energy markets globally, here at home, are undergoing major transformations. The climate crisis is forcing us to look at how energy is generated. While ageing infrastructure, new and, emergency, new and emerging technologies, and the rise of decentralised resources are changing the way we consider distribution, retail and generation. But rather than continue to cling to the past, this changing space provides an opportunity to guarantee low cost, reliable energy for community and businesses alike, while doing our part in reducing emissions and meeting essential climate targets. Investment in renewable, en renewable energy generation is increasing, but more work needs to be done to support a smooth transition. There are now many countries and cities with 100% renewable energy targets, as well as credible and costed roadmaps showing not only is it possible, but cheaper, safer, and will create more jobs than the fossil fuel dependent business as usual approach that we've seen so far. This is why the centerpiece of the Greens energy policy is a commitment to legislating a renewable energy target of a 100% renewable energy by 2030, and a target of net zero emissions by the year 2035. These targets build on the climate change bill I introduced into state parliament last year, which, if endorsed by the Liberals and the Labor parties, I would have, would have legislated both renewable energy and a net zero emissions target and an independent climate council. By legislating clear, achievable targets, we can create the policies that will ensure we are moving WA's energy market forward, that new, new future-ready industries are created and that the community and businesses alike have access to affordable, reliable energy. To support this transition, the Greens will establish two investment funds, a $500 million a year state renewables investment fund and a $2.5 billion, uh, $2 billion sustainable industries fund. And we will implement a comprehensive transition plan for coal and gas workers and communities, in including trading and support. These two funds support innovation and investment in new and emerging technologies, including microgrid and decentralised technologies, large-scale battery storage, and the drive to transition to clean manufacturing in industries by supporting green steel, lithium batteries, and manufacturing green hydrogen. WA's landscape and abundance of renewable energy resources means we could be world leaders in this space. Hydrogen seems to be the buzz of late, but it, but it is a great opportunity for our state. The extraction and burning of, and exporting of LNG has been the main driver behind Australia's 
growing emissions. However, there is an alternative. WA can, tr can transition from LNG to green hydrogen as the state's major export. This would slash WA's overall carbon emissions by 25% and contribute towards the transition to a net zero emissions economy by the year 2035. Hydrogen as a fuel source does not have to be produced from natural gas. It can be manufactured using renewable energy through the process of electrolysis. WA green hydrogen ex exports could generate up to $2.2 billion in revenue by 2030 and $5.7 billion by the year 2040, offering a massive boost to the WA economy and generating a significant number of long-term jobs. It is critical that we take advantage of this, especially as the international markets are looking to reduce their own emissions. Japan and South Korea are two of our biggest energy importers and they have told the world that they want to end fossil fuel imports and substitute it with hydrogen. Additionally, the EU recently announced a carbon pricing scheme. In the short term, an EU pricing, carbon price might not impact WA, but it is an indicator of where other jurisdictions like China might be headed. So without an effective transition plan or pathway to net zero, WA could be left exposed. Green hydrogen will also reduce the, reduce the emissions caused by the state's most carbon intensive industri industry, industrial processes including ammonia production, cement manufacturing and alumina refinery, refining. It will also be used to manufacture green iron and steel and will eventually be used in fuel cells to power heavy haulage vehicles. As I mentioned earlier, the rise of decentralised resources are changing the way we, we consider the energy market. As consumers have increasing control on how they consume and manage their energy, the pace of technological change in the energy sector presents emerging challenges in traditional uh, market definitions and boundaries. I assume there will be some discussion today of retail contestability and the role of synergy. To be clear, the Greens are committed to keeping synergy in the public hands. We must ensure we're, we're always thinking of protecting the community and the most vulnerable in the in energy transition. The Greens will also invest in net zero emission strategies across our economy to further reduce emissions and the climate impacts on our communities and to ensure we reach our targets. The Greens will invest $50 million to roll out the electric vehicle fast charging network across WA by 2025 and introduce incentives for people to purchase EVs for private use in state government fleet targets of 100% by the year 2030. We will electrify our public transport system by fast-tracking the electrification of our bus fleet by 2025 and investing in trackless trams and light rail as the missing link in our public transport system. The Greens will also build 15,000 new social houses to a 7.5 NAFAS energy rating, retrofit existing social houses and implement financial incentives to retrofit private housing. There are many opportunities in the zero carbon transitions and the Greens are committed to making most of them. However, in order to do so, WA must legislate renewable energy and net zero emissions target across the whole of economy and not just government assets. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Now, it's the turn of each speaker to have three minutes in which they can either rebut what the other speakers have said or even raise some questions of their own. So, once again, I'll start with the Minister. Thanks, Dan. Look, uh, it's interesting that the Liberal Party say they want to put $100 million on the table to assist the workforce in Collie, and yet it would cost $500 million to buy out the coal contract. So they're offering five times more to the coal company in Collie than the workforce. Think about that. $500 million to buy out the coal contract, but $100 million for the workforce. This is the problem with the Liberal Party's plan. It's not thought through. It shows that they're inexperienced and they're a risk. The next element of their policy is to lumber synergy with a massive power purchase agreement to support a 1,500 megawatt uh, renewable farm way to the north of Perth, but then cut synergy's uh, ability to sell electricity by allowing the people in this room to undercut synergy's cost. And Synergy will be the most expensive retailer for residences and other companies will be able to discount and peel off their customers, but Synergy gets left with the massive 
uh, power purchase agreement worth over $5 billion. Now, that's not common sense. The Liberal Party say they want to create a net zero target for carbon in Western Australia by 2030, but only for the government and not for the community. What I say is the Labor Party has thought through our proposals. They've been carefully analysed. They've been worked together through a detailed process to make sure that they're achievable and realistic. Yes, there is a transition happening in energy, and we welcome that. Unlike the Liberal Party, who ran adverts at the last election attacking uh, renewable energy, we support renewable energy and lower carbon outcomes, but it has to be done through a proper transition. I just want to finish and point out that the largest investment in renewable energy in Western Australia is not funded by large companies, it's not funded by the government. It's funded by households. That's why the DER roadmap was the first element of our transition strategy, because we understand the, the chaos that will be allowed to happen in the energy system if we don't deal with distributed energy resources. We have to integrate DER into the system. Creating a 1,500 megawatt uh, renewable energy farm over 1,000 kilometres from Perth is not a real solution. And that's why we say it's a, a, just another example of the inexperience of the Liberal Party and why they're a risk to Western Australia. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Dr Honey, would you like to take your turn? Yeah, how unkind, uh, Minister. <laughs> we say nice things about each other in Parliament normally, but uh, look, um, can I say the Minister uh, simply couldn't be, be, uh, be more wrong in this. Look, you know, there are some outstanding journalists, in fact, probably the, a couple of them uh, are in this room, um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I'd encourage all of you to read the excellent article online by Boiling Cold, um, which discusses Labor's energy policy and the pitfalls of, of Labor energy's policies. And I couldn't articulate it any better than that policy. The trouble is that Labor are half on the pot. They're half committed to going to renewable energy, but then they're committed to maintaining union jobs in Collie um, with the coal-fired power stations with this vague commitment to say, well, we're going to close them sort of sometime and Muja C and D are going to go by the way in 22 and 24, um, but otherwise, um, you know, we'll close them at some other time. You know the truth. The people of you in this room that operate boilers know those power stations are being destroyed because they're not baseload, they're swing. And they're up and down. I've managed, uh, I've, but the production manager at Quinana Refinery managed a 160 megawatt power station. And can I tell you, the last thing we ever did was turn the boiler up and down because you destroyed them and it cost millions of dollars to do your overhauls. And that's what happens. The cost of running those coal fired power stations is huge. Uh, Synergy's uh, operations costs, their, their consumable cost are 906 million. 41% of their energy is coming out of, out of those power stations. At least 41% of that, that cost is, is those uh, power stations there, 360 million. Now, the analysis was done. WA Today did an analysis. They said our policy would cost for the same energy $230 million. Um, there's a, another excellent article by uh, Renew. Um, uh, Renew Economy, uh, which uh, uh, published uh, Renew, yeah, Renew Economy article, and they did a detailed analysis and a very clever analysis of the policy, independent from us. We didn't ask them to do it. What they said was that our policy, if enacted, would lead to a 10% reduction in power costs. A 10% reduction. So, in fact, the government agencies can expect to have uh, have more money. Uh, in, in their coffers, which can I tell you as a net group actually make a profit if you take out the non-cash items for their, uh, their total transactions. So, you know, this is a sensible policy that's been well thought out and well costed. We know it's not trivial. We're not in government. The government wouldn't put in the parliamentary budget office that we asked um, to give us the details, so we have to rely on those things. We know it's not trivial, but we're confident that the costs that we have put in here uh, are reasonable costs and are reasonably accurate costs. We know the devil's always in the detail, it's not trivial. But if you don't have a hard goal, if you're not driving yourself, and I know that people in the business people in this room, none of you sit there with vague targets or something, <laughs> something, something 30 years out and go, oh, we'll get there one day. You don't do that. You say, no, we're going to get in there, we're going to do this now. And we know the public of Western Australia, and that's who we're representing. We're representing the electors in, the, in Western Australia. We know that when we go to their, their uh, homes, that they say, we want renewable energy and we want government to show leadership, and that's what we're doing. Thank you, Dr Honey. Tim, your turn. Yeah, um, it's, uh, 
you know, being up here, it's pretty unsurprising, I guess. Um, I sort of anticipated some of these arguments today and a bit of backwards and for forwards over more attack and, and, less, and, less, and less positivity. Um, I, th I really think that we have a real opportunity in this state to do amazing things with our energy system and to provide lots of jobs for lots of people and a lot of young people who are looking to uh, get involved in, in, in engineering spaces, in some of these energy firms. I was in uh, California early last year and I spoke to the EPA there and they've got an ambitious net zero emissions target by 2045 for a state of which I believe is the fifth or the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, and I spoke to some of those officials and I said, what does the target mean to you? And it means that it means a surety and it means people can look to the future and they know what, what space they're operating within. And it also means that when you're looking at the most vulnerable people in our community, you have a transition plan for them. Because at the end of the day, uh, a patchwork between um, working towards, okay, technology's gonna get there, but we don't know, not sure how, but eventually we might have a target or we might just have a, a piecemeal uh, policy approach. It's not good enough when we're looking at ageing infrastructure, and I think ultimately we've got infrastructure, technology and timing colliding all at this one point, which, which requires us to be more ambitious and positive and requires us to look to the future. I'm excited about the, the space that we're working in. I'm excited about how we can look at our energy grid, transform it, democratise energy, allow, allow put power back into people's hands, ensuring that with new technologies around battery storage, rolling out large-scale batteries to home battery storage so we have things like people can trade within their own networks, lowering power costs. But, but we do need targets, we need, need a comprehensive policy. And going to uh, my point, like last year, I did mention before that I introduced a climate um, change policy which had a renewable energy target within that space. I spoke to people in the industry and I spoke to people, we went far and route wide, not Greens, Support, support us necessarily, but they said we need a target, we need something to work towards, we need something that we can put our energy behind, we need to know where we can put our investments, and we need to know, we need to know how we can work within this space. I do have concerns with the Liberal Party policy. Last week, um, a lot of the uh, messages I got, not only from friends, but um, through the media, it's like, oh geez, the Liberals are going green now. Um, but I think the devil's in the detail when you look at the... <laughs> Look at the, um, you look at the fact that we cannot have, we need to look at the transition away from gas. LNG is a pariah around, is a pariah. It's going to, if we, if we hitch so much of our economy to the LNG industry without offering a transition plan for it, we're going to have a, a situation, we're going to have stranded assets and we're going to have a situation where we don't take advantage of green hydrogen, which I think the future is at, because you imagine, if that um, uptake, that, um, that amount of hydrogen was, was produced by renewable energy as opposed to gas, we would have thousands of jobs uh, working in installations, working on these plants. We would have jobs for many people. And I think ultimately, I used to be a construction worker. I worked through the ups and downs of a boom and bust cycle. And I can tell you, I would have loved when, you know, when the GFC hit in 2008, I would have loved to have been offer, offered an opportunity to work in WA's renewable energy sector. And I think that's something that we need to focus on and provide for people. Thank you, Tim. All right. So now it's the turn of the audience to ask some questions. So if you've come full armed with any, um, get ready to fire them off. I might just take the opportunity to ask uh, the first couple of questions myself. Um, the first one I'll put to you, Minister. Um, the Liberal Party has quite obviously moved to outflank your government on decarbonising the electricity system. So do you take that as a sign that Labor isn't moving fast enough to retire coal-fired uh, you know, power capacity and transition to renewable energy? No, because this isn't a genuine attempt to deal with the issues in Western Australia. They've come up with a crazy plan that doesn't work. What this is about is, is the Kimberley Canal process where you make a big announcement that's very complicated and you say you work out the details later. It's responding to Joe Spagnolo in the Sunday Times who called for this. But on the weekend he said this. He said, maybe I should have reworded my column. Big, idea, po big policy ideas that don't make you look silly. And that's the problem with the Liberal Party's policy. It's not a genuine attempt to deal with climate change. The idea that you can build that the best way forward is to build a single facility a long way from demand 
does not make sense to anybody who understands the electricity system. If the Liberal Party had simply adopted the whole system plan and, and the energy transformation strategy that we've been part of, I would have welcomed that. If they'd said, uh, don't worry about the fact that the Federal Liberal Party has set the climate target for 2030, which Western Australia has to comply with, uh, we're going to lobby the Federal Liberal Government to move their 2030 target, I would have welcomed that. If they had joined us in having an economy-wide zero net target for 2050, I would have welcomed that. Uh, this is not, unfortunately, it's un they take all these important words like green hydrogen, green steel, uh, Western Australian manufacturing, write them in a single document, don't consult with anybody in the sector, don't talk about the uh, the costs only talk about the benefits. It's not a serious plan. Are you comfortable, though, Minister, that the government isn't vulnerable to accusations that it's lacking ambition? No, we have a very ambitious target. We have net zero by 2050 as our target. If the Commonwealth Government wants to change the 2030 target for Australia, we would welcome that. And we would very much like working with the Federal Government in, if, they, if we could convince them to change their target. I'm a member of what used to be called the Coag Energy Council. I, I have been calling for action from the Commonwealth Government for a long time. Perhaps my Liberal colleague would like to join with me in lobbying the federal Liberal colleagues to change their position. Um, next question to you, um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Honey. How wedded are you to this policy? If the polls are proved accurate and the Liberal Party does not win at the election next month, will you stay committed to this policy? Look, uh, absolutely. Can I say, um, you know, I, I've been on this journey for 30 years or actually a bit more. When I went to university, I did a PhD in chemistry, physical chemistry. I've built uh, fuel cells. And I can tell you back then, the dream was about the hydrogen economy. And for detail, there was a chap, Professor Bokras uh, from Texas A&M, uh, who was pursuing this. Um, and that was great excitement at the time that that was possible. It was never possible. And I've followed this uh, uh, as closely as I can. The thing that's convinced me about this is, and, and it has been, and I think Tim put it really well, you've got a confluence of things. There's just been a massive technological change. You know, you saw very quickly the slides on the uh, contestable, uh, uh, sorry, the levelised cost of energy for wind and solar. I mean, that's profound. I and mean, I have, you know, various people send me lots of stuff and some people, there's a, a nuclear lobby who are very passionate that nuclear is a solution to zero carbon emission. They tell me that the, the levelised cost out of that is 10 cents uh, a kilowatt hour on the papers that I've seen. Well, that's twice um, the cost of, of renewables. So the simple truth is that those renewables are the lowest cost of energy and we're passionate about households having the lowest um, cost of energy uh, in this state. And can I say the Minister refers to the whole of the whole of uh, system plan. I mean, Peter Milne uh, really did a, a good analysis of this, and go and read his article because it's good. And what he makes very clear and what we've seen is it's half a plan. It's half a plan that's hamstrung by connections to unions uh, in Collie, and it stops the government going the full distance that they need to go. And look, in, in this, this nonsense of not consulting, we've consulted widely with this policy, and we've consulted with people who are experts to get that sense. We're not trying to just throw numbers out there. Numbers are based, for example, the power line costs are based on stage one of that initial project. So we've got those numbers and we know what stage two is in relation to that. So these fanciful numbers that the Minister's thrown out. You look, you know, Labor's got no credibility on numbers. Metronet was going to cost how much, Minister? $800 million. Well, it's two and a half billion now, heading north, two years overdue. And in fact, they're peeling costs into off into highway projects and off into the forest field air link project to try and bring that cost down. So 800 million to, uh, to 2 billion. And the same people that are going to spend $6 billion on an outer harbour when we've got a harbour that exists that's only at a third capacity. There's not a person in this room that would do that. So Labor's got no credibility on the dollars. We've, we've consulted widely. Uh, we've done the work to, to, uh, uh, to see all of those costs. And look, in terms of the Commonwealth, the common, you know, in our view, it's up to the state government to show leadership, to say, well, yep, we'll show leadership if the state government, uh, you know, if the Commonwealth government sort of comes on board. No, we're saying the state government needs to show leadership. We don't want to sit there and moralise to the private sector in this space um, when, as a government, we're not doing enough and we're not meeting the community's expectations. La last one from me, uh, and I'll 
if I could get your answer quickly, that'd be great. Yep. Will you commit to this policy if it brings you into conflict with the Prime Minister and the federal Liberal government? Um, absolutely. Look, um, you know, we're a broad church in the Liberal Party and, and uh, you know, we know that there's a wide debate on this, but we believe that this is the policy that is right for Western Australia. You know, I've had communications with uh, various federal colleagues and that's been commented on in the press. We're committed to this policy. Um, we believe this is the policy that the people of Western Australia want. Great. I'm just turning to the audience now, could I please have a show of hands from anyone who would like to ask a question? Uh, right, I'll uh, start at the back. Uh, the blue shirt, please. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Ian Porter from Sustainable Energy Now. Um, I've got a question for the Minister and for Dr Honey, but I'll start with Dr Honey. First of all, thank you for raising the bar and uh, bringing us to a higher level of... Um, quality in terms of what we're going to see in terms of emissions policy in the future. So I would presume that you are going to set in concrete a firm target for state assets, as you've said in your plan. Um, but can you tell us how you're going to solve the problem of generator of last resort? Because when you shut down coal in 2025, and you're going to replace it with 500 mega 1,500 megawatts of wind and a 500 megawatt battery, you do not have dispatchable. You cannot meet dispatch. And so, missing from your plan is the alternative additional uh, backup that you're going to need to have to compensate for that. Um, and to the Minister, uh, thank you as well for your uh, raising the bar as well uh, over the past three years. Um, I would ask um, if in the future, instead of putting a WASP, which is supposedly a plan, which was not a plan, could you put forward a, a plan to engage with the likes of, and I would suggest AEMO as the correct organisation to provide a generation plan, not just supposed uh, demand scenarios that we might see without the backing of what the real meat and potatoes should be in terms of the generation mix. So they are the two questions I would like to put forward. Would you like me to go first? Look, cheers. If you look at the coal-fired uh, power generation capacity, uh, Muja C is scheduled to close in 22. Um, that's G5 and G6 is, is scheduled to close in 24. That's 400 megawatts of power that's coming out of the system in any case. The two remaining power stations have a combined output or capacity of just on 500 megawatts. So that's what you have to um, deal with. There's three gigawatts um, of non-coal uh, uh, power available in the system right now. Um, and the 500 megawatt battery. Now, we've talked about a transition. Um, that's where you have to go and, and, uh, and perhaps do that analysis. But in fact, it's not a large gap to close. And we know, and I've, you know, I've spoken with your organisation, I mean, you know, your modelling says you have to have 15%, 85% renewables um, with appropriate battery, and then there's 15% um, gas that's required to give you that levelling in the system and that balance in the system. Um, but in fact, if you look at the total energy consumption out of that electricity work, there's substantial uh, non-coal uh, energy generation uh, capacity in the network right now, which adds up to around three gigawatts in that whole system. Uh, and they're distributed across the state, can I say, those various power stations that connect into the system. I'll uh, answer my part. Look, uh, I don't understand the question because AMO has been essential in the whole system plan. AMO was a valued participant in the modelling process and anybody who suggests AMO does not support the outcomes of the WASP modelling does not know anything about AMO's response. Go and read their media release that they put out when the whole system plan was published. Don't forget the energy transformation strategy came out of a workshop that I held with uh, AEMO, what was then the Public Utilities Office, and Western Power on a Saturday at the Holiday Inn in the city. So AEMO was there, they, were, they are one of the, the, uh, the midwives of the energy transformation strategy and they have been an essential component. And that's why this idea that you build a 1500 megawatt uh, renewable project a thousand kilometres north of Geraldton or 500 kilometres north of Geraldton is so silly. The whole point of the whole system plan shows that the best place to put new extra renewable is on the south country because as you re retire the coal plant that gives you capacity to put extra electrons into the system. 
I hate to point this out, but one of the big costs of moving to renewables is infrastructure costs. Uh, you know, we've got Alinta, we've got Clean Heat, we've got Perth Energy. Dr Honey is telling them that they're silly, that they should be closing their gas-fired plant and building renewables. But they're not doing it. They're adding renewables, but they're not cur currently closing their existing facilities. And the reason for that is they need firm power. And that's like the 500 megawatt battery, megawatt hour battery that the Liberal Party are proposing. That's 20 minutes, 20 minutes of supply from the 1500 megawatt facility. If you think you can balance the network with 20 minutes of support, you're crazy. That's why in our costing, in my costings here that I've, I've put on the table, I'm saying two hours. That would at least give you time to get the, the, uh, the gas generators up. But if Dr Honey, if you think that two hours is, is not enough, you tell us what it is. If you don't think $624 million of additional gas uh, generation is enough, you tell us what you need. If you don't think, like AMO has told me, that you need three uh, connection points for a, a distant uh, wind farm, which is exactly what AMO told me, then you tell me what AMO told you when you proposed your uh, idea. Um, would you like the chance to respond to that? Look, uh, it's pretty simple why we want to build this in the Midwest. We know that the capacity factor of the wind farms that exist in the Midwest are at 47%. We know that building them down at Collie, not only is it technically substantially more difficult to build at Collie than to build on the flat uh, windy land, but the capacity factor of those systems is substantially lower. So what it means is, is that your capital investment is substantially higher to, re to uh, gain the same uh, power output. So that is why we're putting it there. And I also know that, the, in fact, the uh, people have an intuitive view of the power loss um, when you're taking the power in that distance. In fact, the power loss is a fraction of what people intuitively imagine in their mind um, through that distance. And in fact, the modelling that we've looked at indicates that it's a, at most around 6 to 7% if you, you're bringing it all the way down to Collie, which, look, it's a logical place to bring it for distribution. And the Minister's correct that Collie's a logical distribution point. Um, but, of course, you can also use that energy on the way. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions from the floor? Uh, could I please get the microphone to the gentleman with the red shirt at the front? Hi, uh, Graham Hansen from Wacos. Uh, my question's for Dr Honey in relation to the safety net that you're proposing in, the contestable, in a contestable market. Um, obviously, this is in recognition of the fact that the experience over East has been that low-income consumers have not benefited from com competition because they are uh, the m least likely to shift between providers. But so my concern would be that the scenario that you're proposing will mean that low-income earners end up paying the highest price for electricity in the market because everyone else will be the ones benefiting from these, uh, the ability to shift while they're stuck at the ceiling. Um, look, so. I guess there's a, a couple of parts to that. One, yes, absolutely. Look, we don't believe anyone should be worse off, and, and that's a bottom line because, you know, one of the obvious issues that people have raised is to say, oh, well, there's an experience of, of prices going up. So we've said, you know, under this policy at no stage can they charge more than the, the synergy maximum target. Look, in, in terms of that capacity to move, I think you can only, and for people who are suffering disadvantage, as you would know, um, there are already significant programs in place for those people. I think I, I'm not sure what else you can do other than, you know, hold someone's hand in being able to to make that move. I, I think that for the people who are, are most disadvantaged in society, you know, there are other government programs, and as the minister would know, there are significant programs uh, to reduce energy cost. But it is critically important that people are no worse off because you, you're quite right. You don't want someone left sort of holding the metaphoric baby. Um, in, in terms of the cost impact of this. Uh, I uh, might pass the microphone to Peter Milne at the back. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Dr. Ann. Um, first, Dr. Honey, thanks for the free plug. Um, uh, question to the Minister. Um, two parts. I noticed you said the net zero by 2050 target. Can I take it the government regards it as a target and not a wishy-washy aspiration? It's a serious question. And what's the second question? Well, the, the second question is you, you um, asked Dr Honey he should adopt a whole system plan. As you've actually said to me, the whole system plan is just modelling of four scenarios. In your first seven minutes, you did an excellent summary of what your government's done in the last four years, 
You've said nothing about any actions or decisions you will make in the, in, in the coming four years. What new initiatives? So first, could you, uh, uh, the net zero, is it a target? And what are your plans for the next four years? Yes, Thank you. The Labor, Labor government's been very clear about our position on carbon. We want to get Western Australia to net zero by 2050. We've said that dozens of times. The Premier said that. Uh, that's what we believe should occur. And we're working with industry, exactly as industry's asked us to do. And let me make it clear. You know, I deal with all the big companies. I deal with the companies that, in the energy sector. They've all got their own plans about how they want to get there. Uh, we're working with the GTEs about uh, exposure of their uh, climate risks. That's uh, one of the great things that we've been able to achieve. We're working together collectively to get the system ready for a, a, a low carbon future. And the whole system plan provides important guidance to us. And that's why it was so welcomed by industry for the investments that are needed. And those investments are in the poles and wires. Now, Dr Honey doesn't seem to understand the challenge for placing a large, your single largest generator a long, long, long way from where the electricity gets used. It means you have a risk of an outage on that line. And I note that uh, the report that Dr Honey refers to says that uh, this will provide Western Australia with 97% reliable electricity. That means 11 days a year the Liberal Party are planning to switch the lights off. That's their plan. They are saying that 11 days every year you'll have system black. Now, if you think that's good enough, I don't. We're about a sensible transition. And as I said during my uh, opening remarks, the biggest part of that transition is people doing things on their roof. Now, Wacos asked this very good question about uh, uh, vulnerable consumers. Firstly, we're addressing vulnerable consumers by setting up a forum and research program to deal with that. But secondly, we've got the uh, Solar Energy on Social Housing project to bring the benefits of, of uh, distributed energy resources to uh, vulnerable consumers, exactly as recommended by the DER Roadmap. So if you want to know what we're doing for the next four years, read the DER Roadmap, read the whole system plan, and look at the 700 pages of new rules that we're implementing here in Western Australia that everybody in the industry knows about. Now, I reckon we've got time for one more question, and I might give it to the hand at the back Me? on the left. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Lomas from PwC, from our infrastructure team based in Perth. I have a question for any speaker that would like to respond, and it's in relation to maybe moving beyond our domestic energy needs to thinking about the scale of the challenges that we have as a globe. Um, what role do you see uh, Western Australia playing in solving or helping to solve the energy transition globally, and what benefits do you expect the West Australian community um, could expect to, to see from that. Yeah. Thank you. Do you do Was that addressed to anyone in particular? I think it's for all of us. Any speaker. Uh, look, would, if you could all maybe very quickly touch on it. 60 seconds. Uh, you go, Minister. You're the... start with, let's start with Tim. Uh, yeah, I see uh, WA is playing a significant role in the global energy market. I see WA as we have some of the brightest minds here. We have some of the greatest resources, as I alluded to before. We have an abundance of renewable energy in different parts of this state that we can use to export hydrogen, but also in training and, and upskilling people um, and using some of those great technologies that we can um, implement to allow for trading within um, different modular networks to be applied to different parts of the world. And I see us in not only in the space of producing hydrogen and, and harnessing our renewable energy to produce those uh, assets to export, but I also see us as, as a leader in being able to train people and make sure they can um, work in those different spaces. Yeah, look, um, I, I think it's, it is a, a fantastic opportunity. You know, you can either be a sort of a passenger or a driver uh, in these changes, and, you know, this is, this is the opportunity for our universities to tool up uh, and to train the graduates, the scientists, the engineers. You know, our, our Minister and I have had discussions about this in Parliament. We have the most outstandingly talented uh, trades workforce in Western Australia and we need to beef that up to, to meet the challenge for this industry. So that's a, a great chance for us to uh, be leaders and then export that knowledge and technology around the world. In relation to hydrogen, it's not trivial to export hydrogen but 
but there's, there's unlikely to be anywhere in the world that will produce hydrogen as cheaply as us. So we'll be most able to, to uh, ship hydrogen overseas. Now, whether it's in ammonia or whether it's in urea or whether it's you know, in, in some hydride or whatever you're going to do it in, um, no one's going to have a cheaper feedstock than us. But because of that large cost differential for transported hydrogen versus hydrogen here, it is genuinely, and, and, and different to everything else we've had, genuinely the chance for us to have. If we're talking about green manufacturing, green steel, there's probably nowhere in the world that will make cheaper green steel than us or green pig iron. So that's a fantastic opportunity. So I think, you know, we can be a primary feed of green resources into manufacturing around the world. And countries like Germany and Sweden and other countries that are trying to go to zero, we can give them iron input into steel manufacture that will have no carbon associated with it. So I think that's an enormous opportunity as well. I, you thank, know, thank I you, genuinely thank you, David. believe so, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Thank so, you. Look, everybody knows the hydrogen story and just because you write it in a policy document doesn't mean you own that idea. So there's no question that hydrogen is coming to Western Australia, and that's exciting. But there's actually things in front of us right now that this government's thinking about too. And let's give the example of standalone power systems. We're the centre of the world for standalone power systems. There are 1.5 billion people in the world that don't have access to reliable electricity. That's a market for us today. Those people are being assisted by World Bank and all these other organisations to build traditional systems. Actually, They'll be cheaper, better, faster coming to Perth and buying our standalone power systems and having Western Australian engineers install them. So there's opportunities today. We don't have to wait till hydrogen becomes viable. We've got viable manufacturing industries using Western Australian technology available today. Thank you very much, Minister. And thank you to all of you uh, for your time. Very much appreciated. That's, that's it from me and from the speakers, please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone today for attending uh, the event and thank you in particular of course to our three politician speakers and for Dan for doing a fantastic job uh, as moderator. So, <laughs> Oh, cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Before we uh, the wrap up, I'd like to do um, a quick round up of the next Australian Institute of Energy events. So one of the great things about COVID um, was that we realised we were actually a national organisation, uh, and that meant that we had the um, the opportunity to start opening up events across the country. So if you're interested in what's happening in terms of networks, like uh, I work for Western Power, so I am. Um, this Thursday, um, February 18, there, South Australia is doing a Flexible Grid, a demand-side transformation um, online event, if you'd like to check that out. Um, and the next lot of events are coming um, the following week. So on February the 24th, Women in Energy are having a networking event. Um, and we do remind people that while Women in Energy has women in the name, men and Anyone else is also welcome to join. Um, we want to foster a, an entirely kind of open and collaborative network there. Um, the day after, the Young Energy Professionals uh, had their presentation on an overview of the new brand new, uh, as the Minister pointed out, with the 700 pages of market rules, uh, the new wholesale electricity market. Um, that is the event that was going to be held on the 11th uh, of February, but we have deferred it so that we can all enjoy each other without face masks. Um, human muzzles, as I like to call them. Um, Women in Energy are also preparing for uh, their International Women's Day event. It will be on March 9th. Not March 8th, but March 9th. Um, and I want to give a really big highlighted in yellow uh, notification for the next Energy and WA conference. So we have, of course, been exposed to the um, wiles of COVID um, and we are going through a whole new time frame. So it's going to be May 5th and 6th. Please put placeholders in your diary and make sure you are available. We're looking for sponsors 
So if you've purchased a table today, maybe you think about purchasing a little bit of a sponsorship spot. Um, we're also looking for speakers. So if anyone has some great ideas, if you've heard anyone, particularly from WA, considering COVID does mean we're going to be a little bit more WA focused than we have been in the past. Um, but if you have speaker suggestions, uh, please get in touch with the Australian Institute of Energy. Um, and we'd also like to acknowledge our friends um, at Energy Policy WA, who we co-host the conference with. Um, we are a membership organised based organisation. Uh, we're entirely um, volunteer run with the wonderful Cletta, the um, only exception to that, who's our executive assistant. Um, but we can only host these events by having um, our members support what we do. Membership is $35, starting point for students, all the way up to $175 for individual membership. You do get discounts for these events, you get the Energy News Quarterly Journal, you get my endless gratitude uh, and love and thanks. So um, please do consider becoming a member of the Australian Institute of Energy. And even if you're not, think about um, joining our LinkedIn pages. So Australian Institute of Energy, Women in Energy and Young Energy Professionals all have our own page. Um, if anyone is on any of those committees, can you please stand up in the audience? So I know uh, Nidika, so we've got Murray and Brad on the AIE committee, Alicia on the AIE, Lauren is also here from the AIE, Nidika, who is our chair of Women in Energy. So if you have any questions, please track down any of those people. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the Pan Pacific Hotel um, with their snazzy new foyer uh, for hosting us here today, um, and Steve Millsteed um, from Mantis Video Productions for, sorry, what did I say? <gasps> do, you know, do you know, this is, and I feel terrible because actually the last time we were at Pan Pacific, I said Parliament House, which was even worse. <laughs> so I'm running, I'm on a really good hit rate at the moment. Uh, so yeah, Parmelia Hilton, thank you. Um, and um, Steve Milstead from Mantis Video Productions. So we are going to be releasing a video of today's event. Um, hopefully we'll get it out first thing in the morning. Our secretariat is Eastern Coast based, so it does create some timing challenges. But if you would like to watch it again, if you thought it was that good, you can watch it again or you can share it amongst your network and we would encourage you to do so. So thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you've still got a couple of minutes to, to say hello to some friends and some new colleagues and share some LinkedIn details because it's more COVID friendly than business cards. Uh, thank you very much and we'll see you next time.